we are done with the recurrence neural network uh, section. Uh, the, that whole chapter is done. So um, actually the um, technique that we're gonna cover today, word embeddings, it is uh, um, quite closely related to the RN uh, models because uh, word embedding uh, is a way, is a uh, kind of a backbone technology for modern uh, natural language processing uh, technology. Uh, it is a very efficient, uh, actually very effective way to model word meanings, um, to convert each word into a meaningful vector. And that can be uh, closely coupled with uh, uh, recurrent neural network based models for, uh, for example, for uh, modeling the meaning of uh, sentences or paragraphs or utterances in a dialogue and so on. Okay, so the word, word embedding is really the one of the most basic building blocks for modern uh, natural language processing uh, applications. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So we'll look at, uh, first of all, what it is, right? We are going to introduce the idea of the so-called distributed representation for words. And <clears throat> we'll start from a analogy, uh, not using a word as an example, but we use a distributed representation for daily items, or objects. And we will see that this idea will can easily apply to words in the language. And the second part is to look at how we train a word embedding models. And we will use word to vec which is a technique uh, first proposed in the year 2013. And it's uh, quite a very big um, breakthrough at that time because it provides very efficient ways to train um, uh, useful word embedding. Uh, vectors. Okay, so let's uh, look at what word embeddings as a technique, what it is really are, uh, what it is really uh, um, the, the technique behind. So we'll start from the weakness from, from we'll look at the one hot encoding. So uh, in the RN lecture two weeks, a week ago, we talk about the way to um, um, encode a word in a, in a sequence or in a sentence. So we can basically uh, look at all the unique words uh, in the data and we can build a vocabulary. Say we have a vocabulary of 10,000 unique words and then we can use the position of that word within that vocabulary as a way to construct a long vector, right? So for each word, we have a bunch of zeros and just one uh, non-zero, only one in one position, okay? So the word, the article word A is the most frequent word in the vocabulary. So it occupies the first elements in that long vector. So we use uh, O1, O2, and O3, and O is for one hot, to indicate those one hot vectors, okay? So these are really long vectors depending on the size of your vocabulary. So, uh, so let's take a more uh, concrete example. Say we have man and woman, right? Uh, apparently their meanings are closely related to each other. They all refer to human beings, but of just different, they are of just uh, of different genders. So, um, we can see that the one hot encodings for them are like this, depending on the frequencies of the words in the vocabulary. So uh, man, the non zero or the one position of the one is at the index 5,391. So this position is totally dependent on the data. So if that the data we use happen to have more uh, mans, then the position of men will be higher. But if we happen to have a more, uh, less, uh, fewer women in our data, then the 
uh, index of women would be different. So depending on the data sets, right? If it's in a different data sets, then the men and women, they are, the one hot encodings may change, okay? And other examples like king and queen, they all have those uh, word indexes, indices associated to each word, okay? So this is the previous, how previously we encode each word before we feed the word, uh, use the word as input to um, maybe RNN-based models, right? So we can see the shortcoming of this one hot encoding is that the distance between any pair of words are the same, okay? Because it's a one hot vector and the Euclidean distance between any two one hot, uh, one hot encoded vectors is like this, is one minus zero raised to the power of two plus, so this is one dimension and this is the other non-zero dimension. So that's the only two dimensions if we are comparing a distance, or if we are computing a distance between two vectors, right? Uh, unless the two vectors are the same one, then the distance will be zero. But any different words, any different vectors, the distance remain the same, okay? And that is not what we want, right? Because a good representation or a good vector representation for a word should be encoded with some meanings of the word. Say so we, of course, we want the man and woman to be close rather than man is close to animals or to other objects, right? We want the difference, we want the same, the, the words with the similar meanings to uh, be closer, right? To cluster uh, towards each other. So that's what cannot be achieved using one hot encoding, okay? And also if we use a different measurements, say cosine distance, because uh, all these one hot encodings, they are perpendicular to each other. If we compute the cosine distance between any two of those one hot encodings, it will be zero. So we don't want that, right? For example, in a language modeling task, given a word, given a context word, I would like some apple juice, right? And if we have encountered a similar word, I would like some orange. And our task is to predict what the next word is. And of course, if we know the meaning of orange, say we know that orange and apple, they are both fruits, then it is more likely to produce the next word juice, right? So how do we uh, use a different ways to encode the words so that a program, a computer program can understand, okay, this vector may have a closer meaning towards that vector instead of the other vector. That is something we want to uh, explore in the next few slides, okay? All right, so that's why we uh, people uh, propose the alternative method to one hot encoding, which is called distributed representation. So using this, uh, 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 daily objects uh, as an example here, we have, um, so if you look at the column here, the first column, these are the four objects that we want to represent. A horizontal rectangle, a vertical rectangle, horizontal uh, ellipse, ellipse and a vertical ellipse. So, uh, so on the left, it is basically kind of a one heart encoding. So the black dot indicates a one. And these four columns are the features, like uh, feature, let's call it feature A, feature B, feature C, feature D, okay? And those features are very uh, naive features because it says horizontal rectangle, then it is true for the first object and it is, must be non-true, all zeros for the rest uh, for the rest of the three columns. And similarly for the second object, it is it has a one here and then all zeros over the other columns. So this is a typical, on the left, it's a typical one-hot encoding, right? And 
on the right, then we use more uh, higher level or abstract features like horizontal, right? This is the first feature, vertical, second feature, rectangle, third feature, uh, ellipse, last feature. So if we use these features instead, then the vector, <clears throat> if, we're, if we look at the first column, the first column becomes the vector one, zero, one, zero, because it is horizontal and it is a rectangle, right? <clears throat> then this feature becomes, um, um, uh, first, it's different. It's not a one hot. It has more, it is encoded with more meanings, right? It uh, tells the, uh, um, it, it, it tells the reader that, okay, for the horizontal feature, I, <clears throat> um, I have true here, I have one here. And also for the rectangle feature, I also have one, which means I represent these two uh, uh, properties or attributes, okay? So if you look at, um, compare the first row with the, with the third with the third row third row is a horizontal um ellipse right then if you look at this vector it is one zero zero one right you can see the overlap <clears throat> with the third row vector with the first row is this column right is the horizontal column they have overlap which means the similarity between the first object and the, the third object is in the first feature, is in the first attributes. They both represent, they both present the horizontal feature, right? <clears throat> and which means we can compare um, the, <clears throat> we can compare the objects by comparing the distance between the vectors. The vectors are now more semantic. They are not arbitrary uh, vectors. Say so if you look at the one hot encoding, it, it doesn't have such a semantic property, right? Uh, the third feature for the, <clears throat> the third vector, one hot vector is zero, zero, one, zero, okay? And it has nothing overlap, it has no overlap with the first one hot, even though they both look like a horizontal object, right? So on the right, we have the advantage of, uh, encoding uh, semantic meanings into vectors by using a distributed representation. All right, so so far this is not words yet, right? So we're, look, we're going to look at how we can do the same thing to represent a word as a uh, using a <clears throat> uh, distributed representations, okay? So let's do the similar thing for words. If you look at, now we have <clears throat> three pairs of words in this table, uh, in six columns. The first pair, let me use the pair. The first pair, man, woman, king. The second pair is king and green. The third pair is apple and orange, okay? And we have um, four features. The first feature is gender, second, the royal, third age, the last food, okay? And we use real numbers uh, for these four features, okay? Uh, for example, the man, it is negative one for the gender. So we assume that negative one and one are the two extremes of the gender, right? Woman is one. And king uh, is close to negative one because the gender is, uh, close to the men and the queen, it's a female gender. So we have 0.97. So all these numbers I show in the table, they are the random or the makeup numbers that I uh, arbitrarily uh, created, okay? It's not like fixed values, okay? And for apple and orange, because they are not human beings, they don't have such a uh, very explicit genders, okay? And if you look at the last row, food, because men and women, king and queen, they have nothing to do with food, so they show zeros here. But for apple and orange, they kind of show positive values, right? Close to ones, okay? 
And same, same thing can be inferred for the royal feature and the age features. So if we represent a word using these features, it allows us to do a semantic comparison between words. So if we ask the question, um, what is to a king as a woman is to a man, right? If we ask such a question to, and we use a computer program to do the inference, then if the words are encoded using these represented vector, uh, distributed representation, distributed vectors, then we can probably infer that we can take the, uh, first take the vector out, right? Uh, in this case, the vector for man is this first column, okay. Um, excuse me, I uh, hear someone knocking my door. Let me take a look. I'll be right back. Let me pause, let's resume, okay. So we'll take the vector for man out. It is negative 1, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, 0, 0.0, right? And the woman's vector out. So we can use simply use the subtraction to compute the distance between man and woman, okay? And then the main distance, we can notice that it, uh, the main distance exists in the gender's dimension, okay? Because the first dimension uh, is, the, is for the gender feature, okay? And then we can probably look at the second pair again, if we measure the distance by subtracting the vector of king uh, from the vector of queen, we can see the main difference also is in the gender's uh, dimension or the gender feature. So we can see that using this difference, if we use the difference, for example, using the difference between man and the woman, using that delta, and add that delta to the vector of king, then it's quite easy to get the result, which is the queen, right? So we can use something like this uh, arithmetic operation to do automatic inferences. Uh, based on the assumption that all the words are encoded with uh, these uh, feature-based representations, the so-called the distributed representations. Okay, so it looks like a good idea, right? So now the words are not represented by the meaningless one-hot encoding, but more meaningful, rich, uh, more rich features. Okay, so the technically we don't, uh, use the very few features. We don't use um, four features, for example, but we'll use more features like 100 dimensions, 200 dimensions, or even 300, 500 dimensions for each word, okay? So now the table uh, extend um, vertically, like we have 300 rows, for example, compared to the previous table like we can use more features, human, plants, and so on, okay? And that's all just a mind experiment because in practice, we don't do that. We don't like, we don't explicitly uh, assign gender to the first feature and the royal to the second, age to the third. We didn't do that, okay? But it's just an analogy showing that maybe we can include more features, as many as 300, so that the words, uh, they have much uh, richer uh, expressions or much richer representations, okay? So if we take the word apple and orange out, we can do the computation and they are both 300 dimensional vectors, okay? All right, so, so far, we haven't mentioned a bit about how these vectors can be obtained or can be trained, but we'll first give the ideas here. Like we, in theory, uh, ideally we want the, uh, each word can be represented by a long vector, but that vector has maybe 300 dimensions. 
it is not one hot and each element in that vector is a real number. It is not a binary. It is not either zero or one. It is a, uh, it is a, a real number that has some meanings, okay? And we don't need to explicitly uh, design uh, the, each dim dimension, okay? So yeah, let's proceed on to the next few slides. So let's see how the word embeddings can be can be used. Let's see in what uh, application scenarios these uh, embeddings can be used. First of all, it's a, uh, the atypical NLP task named entity recognition, okay? So for example, uh, if we, in a sentence, Edward Jones is an orange farmer and say we want to recognize um, um, the people's name, for example, right? So given the first training sentence, Edward Jones is an orange farmer, for example, if we tell the model that Edward Jones, excuse me, is a person's name, right? Then maybe in the, in a testing case, if we have a test sentence, Richard Lee is an apple farmer, then we also want to do the inference, right? So we hope the model can recognize Richard Lee also as a person's name, right? So based on the fact that apple and orange, they are both uh, fruits, right? So if we have <clears throat> we have seen the training sentence that the orange, if orange occurs here, then the first uh, person's name, the first two words is likely to be a person's name. Then if we uh, come across apple, then it is also likely that the first two words is a person's name. Okay, so that's how the, uh, algorithm do the inferences because apple and orange, they are both uh, fruits, okay? So um, what if we have a more um, unusual word, uh, say pitaya, okay? And also we don't have the, a common word farmer. Uh, for example, we, we have cultivator, okay? And what if these sentence, these two words, they, are, they, they even haven't appeared uh, in the training set yet. They, so let's assume that they haven't appeared at all in the training set. Then how does a model do the inference in this case, right? If the words are not represented by uh, distributed representations, then the computer will not know that, okay, pitaya is not, is a, uh, also a fruit, right? And it doesn't know, it doesn't recognize the word cultivator. It has close meanings to the word farmer, right? So if a computer fail to draw the semantic connections between the fruit words and these uh, um, occupation words, then the, the sentence is not is not likely to be correctly recognized, right? So that's where the word embedding models take effect. Say, uh, if we have um, the loaded, we have used the, the pre-trained word embedding models that contain apple and the pitaya, and those embedding vectors tell you that the pitaya is close to apple, and the word cultivator is close to the farmer. Then we have bringing useful information that pitaya is a fruit and cultivator is a job that is close to a farmer. Then the algorithm is likely to infer, okay, so pitaya cultivator is something similar to apple farmer or orange farmer. Then the, the meaning of the whole sentence is becoming, will become uh, much clearer, okay? So that's the first uh, example of application here. So the second application is to make analogies, which we have mentioned in the two previous slides. Say we represent a man, a woman, and a king uh, with um, 
uh, word embedding vectors, then we can use the distance between man and woman applied to king so that we can find the most nearby to uh, king. It could be queen because they are in a parallel relationship. The closest uh, uh, word to a king along the direction that points from man to woman is queen. So that's how we make the inferences. So what basically the algorithm does is to find uh, the words that maximizes the similarity between the target words and this uh, target position. It is the distance between, um, so it is the king moved towards the direction that points from man to woman, okay? So if we find the most, uh, the, the words that maximizes this similarity, we may, it is likely to find queen, okay? Also, it may also lead to uh, other words because there may be uh, queens, uh, there are different words that, that is nearby to queen, maybe uh, princess, maybe other words, okay? But a successfully trained uh, word, embedding, word embedding model will likely to give the correct answer, okay? So that's the word analogy example. And the similarity function here, uh, which we'll mention later, is some similarity, uh, <laughs> is some function that can uh, mathematically compute the distance, compute the similarity between two uh, vectors. For example, cosine similarity, okay? So uh, we can extend the analogy text to uh, a lot of other realms. So for example, we can use the same technique to answer the question of capital and the, relation, the, the relationship between capital city and the country, okay? Say Berlin is the capital city of Germany, uh, Beijing is the capital city of China, uh, Baghdad to Iraq and so on. And for family members, this is the second category, right? So the relationship between dad and mom, and boy and girl, they are kind of similar words, okay? And city in states and so on, okay? So all these um, analogy tasks, if we use the, uh, a pre-trained word embedding say the word to vac model provided by, uh, proposed by Mikolov in 2013, then we can probably reach a 70 to 80% accuracy in answer these questions, which means uh, maybe 80% of all the analogy tasks can be correctly done, which is amazing task, okay? Because all the meanings uh, are learned from a unsupervised learning task which we'll introduce uh, in the next slide. All the word meaning, all the word embedding vectors, they are not learned in a supervised way, but purely from data in an unsupervised uh, style. All right, so third application, let's mention the similarity uh, uh, measurements a bit. So when we measure the similarity between words, what our assumption is that if the two words have close meanings, say man to king and woman to queen, if their meanings are close, then the distance, the similarity between the vectors should also be, uh, the distance should be small and the similarity should be big, okay? A common similarity measurement that we use is cosine similarity. So given two vectors, the cosine similarity is the dot product between the two vectors, U and V, divided by the norms of the two vectors, okay? And uh, the, 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 the denominator, the numerator is uh, inner product and uh, the denominator is the Euclidean length or the Euclidean norm, okay? And of course, we can also use uh, Euclidean distance, but in practice, we will find that cosine similarity is uh, preferred, um, partially because uh, given a word embedding model trained, we will need, we will use those vectors uh, after we normalize them. So after we normalized all the vectors to unit length vectors, the Euclidean distance between them are less um, uh, informative than the cosine similarity. 
All right. So it's the cosine similarity. It it more or less um, uh, measures how the angles between two vectors. If the two angles, they if the two vectors they are close towards each other, which means they have close meanings, then the angles is smaller, and the cosine value is uh, similarity score is bigger. Okay. And Euclidean distance is defined in a different way. And it's less uh, often, uh, it's, it's, it's much less often used than the cosine distance. Okay. So using the cosine distance between uh, word vectors, we're able to cluster all the embedding, all the word embeddings in the embedding space. And then we can visualize them by uh, reduce the dimension from 300 dimension to 2D space. Okay. So uh, the similarity measurements can be done in the higher space. And then after we cluster them into uh, in, the high, in the high dimensional space, then we can reduce them into a two dimensional space. Okay, using some uh, uh, dimension reduction technique like TSNI or the PCA algorithms, right? You can see that all the numbers uh, clusters together and uh, all the persons, people, uh, cluster here, all the apple, all the um, fruits cluster in different uh, groups. All right, so that's uh, another application we can do is uh, using word embeddings. All right, so having talked about so much about the applications and the uh, ideas behind uh, the distributed representations, let's look at in, in practice, how we can uh, obtain such a uh, very promising, very useful uh, distributed representations for words. We'll use, uh, we'll focus on uh, neural network based methods, uh, particularly the word to vac as an example. And uh, beyond neural network based embedding models, we can have uh, other different types of models uh, based on uh, matrix uh, factorization, uh, which comes long before the neural network based models. But uh, the methods of neural network based models, I think it's easier to understand and it has very um, interesting analogy to uh, how human beings learn to learn the meanings of, of natural, uh, uh, learn the meanings of words in natural language. Okay, so now let's look at it. All right, the uh, overall goal of learning word embeddings is to learn an embedding a matrix, okay? So what is an embedding matrix? Given the vocabulary size, which is 10,000, say in our training data, we have 10,000 unique words and we can list them into columns, right? And our target is to learn uh, a 300 dimension vector for each word in this vocabulary. So the resulting, the results will be a 300 by 10,000 embedding matrix, okay? We need an embedding learned for each word. So we can indicate this embedding matrix, this very large embedding matrix by the capital letter E, okay? For example, if the king is, the king ranks at the position of 3,560, then how do we achieve, how do we retrieve the uh, embedding vector for king? We can use the one hot vector of the king. Right, the one hot encoding for the king is zero 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 until uh, one and zero 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 again, and the one is at a position of 300, uh, 300, 3560. So we can use the uh, multiplication between two matrices, given the embedding matrix E and the one hot vector the O 
king. If we multiply the matrix E with the one hot encoding, it will give us the embedding vector for the king, right? So it's basically a, we put the uh, embedding uh, matrix E on the left and we will multiply it with a very thin long one hot encoding. And because there's a bunch of zeros and only one here, right? The result of doing this matrix multiplication is to extract the column at the position of the king, right? So this is what this uh, uh, matrix multiplication does, okay? And in practice, the matrix multiplication is quite expensive to implement. So technically, uh, we, will, uh, we will implement the whole thing with a lookup table, okay? If you look at uh, in, the, in the original implementation of word to vec uh, how the embedding is achieved, retrieved is using a lookup table, okay? So uh, the, the word king is just a concrete example. So for any random word that is of index, certain index, then we can use the one hot encoding, uh, use the embedding matrix times the one hot encoding of that word, which will return the uh, uh, embedding matrix for us. Okay, so this is a uh, some preparation knowledge or some notations that will be used in the uh, uh, in designing the way of learning the embedding matrix. Okay, so the learning process is like that. So initially, we don't have a e available. It's just a random, it's just randomly initialized. So all the E's, all the entries, all the 300 times 10,000 parameters, uh, the uh, 300 times 10,000 elements in the, uh, in the embedding matrix are the parameters that we need to learn uh, using gradient descent methods. Okay, so uh, the um, how the important uh, goal of gradient descent is to, well, the important task of the gradient descent based method is to design some uh, loss function, right? Using the loss function to compute the gradients and pass the gradients to the, uh, to the, um, to the other parameters. So next, let's look at what kind of learning task we need to design, okay? So, the learning task or the so-called learning objectives in uh, learning, in, in, in obtaining meaningful word embeddings uh, has to be with the language. So previously, when for people first use uh, such a method, they use more complex tasks, right? The, for example, the neural language modeling task, it's, uh, implemented with the regular neural network. And, but still it's very complex. And the word to vec is kind of a simpler task. So we will first look at what a neural network based language model looks like, okay? So we have introduced uh, a language model using recurrent neural network before, right? But uh, this actually can also be done with regular neural network. Although a regular neural network will result in a poor performance in terms of language model, but it still uh, can, be, can be implemented to training the, the word embedding models, okay? So for example, in the neural, regular neural network, we want to use the previous words, all the previous five words, for example, I would like some orange together to predict the next word. Okay, but it's not necessarily recurrent in your network. All right, so let's see the example. The task is to predict the target word given the previous five context words. Okay, so all the integer numbers are the word indices for the words. So for the word I, we can obtain a, the one hot encoding, right? And we use the embedding matrix times the one hot encoding for i, which will give us the embedding vector for i. So this embedding vector 
it's already a 300 dimensional vector, okay? Although it is initialized uh, to be random numbers. So at the beginning, we don't have meaningful, we don't have meanings encoded yet. So this is the conversion from the one hot to the one uh, embedding matrix. So for the second word, we'll do the same thing. Wood will become a one hot vector. And like will be a one hot, uh, would be a embedding vector, right? So now we have five embedding vectors corresponding to the five words. So what do we do with these, all these five uh, 300 dimensional embedding vectors? So we can connect them. So we can first uh, concatenate them into a very long representation and then use a fully connected network to connect to some intermediates, hidden layers, okay? So these can be a fully connected layer. And then we can connect to a soft max layer to predict what this next word is. And this soft max layer has 10,000 outputs, right? Because we have 10,000 possible words to predict ranges from all possible words in the vocabulary, right? So now we have two uh, um, sets of parameters. The first is from W1 and B1. These weight matrices, matrices are connecting from the 300 dimensional embedding vectors to the hidden layer. And the W2 and WB2 is for the soft max layer, okay? So together, in this case, if we use the, uh, five, the first five context words, the inputs would be uh, five times 300, which is uh, 1,500 input elements, okay? So the loss that we obtained uh, by comparing these uh, probability with the actual ground truth label will be backpropped to the input layer, okay? And the input layer is the embedding vectors, okay? So the size of the W1 is determined by how much word embeddings that we will use, uh, how much context words we will use, right? So that is the typical uh, workflow or the computation graph using a regular neural network uh, to predict the next word in a language modeling task. Okay, so <clears throat> because the gradients will be probably will be backpropped to the input layer that contains the embedding vectors, the embedding matrices will be will be updated throughout the process of training, right? Uh, so because in the second example, the inputs will be different words, right? It will be uh, other words rather than I would like some orange. So the longer training goes, the larger data set it goes, then all the possible, all the words will be uh, updated in the same task, in the, in the language, in the next word predicting task. Okay. Now let's look at um, the different settings for the context lens. This actually matters because uh, ideally we want uh, more context words to predict the next word so that the language models are more um, accurate. And we may include five context words in the left and five in the right. But we can also shrink the context if we want to uh, uh, achieve better training speed, right? If we just use, it's also doable if we just use one context word. For example, just use the orange and the width to predict the, the target word choose. And soon people figured out that it's not necessary, it's not necessary to use a very long context. Just a simple one word context is uh, sufficient in, in, in training a good representation, uh, in, in obtaining a good uh, embedding vectors for each word, okay? 
So before we proceed on, I would like to uh, draw some connections to the RN-based uh, language models. So the model we shown here is not a RN-based because the inputs from uh, the word I is not used as the, is not reused in predicting, is not uh, used to predict the word would, right? So in, in RN-based language models, we say that the first word is input into the model, obtaining some hidden vector, a uh, hidden layer, uh, uh, include, uh, resulting in some hidden activations. And that activation is combined with the next word to predict the second output, right? So that's the uh, RN uh, setup. And in the case of RN, the input words are one hot vectors. So which means the weights WAX need to take a, a one hot encoding as inputs, right? Remember the Y, the WAX needs to have one 10,000 uh, columns because the input X is a one hot. So that means the WAX is also a embedding matrix. Remember the embedded matrix has 300 rows and 10,000 columns. So in training an RN model, we implicitly train some embedding matrix WAX, right? But the, the weakness of RN-based training is that it's much slower than training a regular neural network because the back propagation through time, because uh, the forward pass is also uh, mock is more uh, will cost more time than a regular network. Okay, so uh, that's why we usually don't use uh, RN based models to train to obtain an embedding model to 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 obtain a, an embedding matrix. All right, so what do we do uh, with regular neural network? Um, so instead of using a very long uh, context vector uh, using a very very big context. We'll use very short, rather short context in the uh, in the as the learning task. Okay, so now we'll introduce a word to vec <coughs> as an example and look at how in detail the model is designed. So the word is so the model is the uh, proposed in two thousand thirteen, and uh, it contains basically two basic. Uh, uh, mechanism, two designs, two methods. The first is called skip grant, and the second is called continuous bag of words or SIBO. Okay, they have different architectures. So we'll use skip grant as a first example here. <coughs> For example, in the input sentence, I would like some orange juice with some white chocolate chips. Then the program or the algorithm will pick up a word as context. Say we pick up the word orange as a context. And it will randomly pick up another word within some window, within some fixed window as a target. Okay. For example, it picks the, the juice as a target word. And then the task is that given the context words, we can pick multiple target words to predict, okay? The task is to use the context word to predict the target word. We can have multiple pairs. For example, in the first pair, we use the orange to predict juice. Second, we use orange to predict wood. The third pair, we use orange to predict white, and so on, okay? So that is how the skip gram is designed. So let's look at the computation graph and compare how it is different from the regular neural network with long context windows. So now given a context word, the word is orange. So we can use the capital, you use the matrix, the embedding matrix E times the orange, the one hot encoding for orange, which will give us the embedding matrix uh, lowercase e of orange, 
Okay, so that is a 300 dimensional vector. And we'll directly use that 300 dimensional vector to directly connect to a soft max layer that has 10,000 outputs. Okay, and the, the 10,000 uh, outputs, it has 10,000 uh, components, right? Remember the, um, uh, the way that the softmax output is computed, we need to first compute the logits, the Zs, from Z1 to Z10,000, right? And the first components of the softmax y hat one, it is the probability of A, the article word A, uh, given the context orange, right? It is computed by the uh, exponential e to the power of z1 normalized by this normalization term, okay? So all the normalization terms, they are equal, okay? And the numerators are different using uh, e raised power of z, right? So that's how the uh, softmax uh, layers are computed. So now we can use these to compare, to compute the, the loss. Okay, so if we think of the parameters in the softmax layer, it can also be viewed as a second embedding matrix. It is a 10,000 rows by 300 uh, columns embedding uh, matrix. Okay, and uh, uh, associated, associated with each entry in that matrix is the weight matrix. Uh, that will be used to compute the softmax layer, okay? So you can, now let's visualize it a bit by how the Zs, so the Z capital Z indicates the Z1, Z2 to the uh, 10,000, and it's a very long vector, okay? So it is just the results of multiplying these uh, 10,000, row by 300 column E prime vector with the embedding vector E orange, okay? So this E orange is from here, from the embedding, the first embedding matrix without the prime, okay? So if we multiply a, three, a 10,000 by 300 matrix with the 300 by one embedding vector, it will give us a 300 by, uh, a 10,000 by one, uh, embedding uh, output vector, which is the probabilities, okay? So actually what happens here is simply that if we take out a ZI, the I's components within this capital Z is the inner product between the I's row in the second embedding vector with the uh, embedding of orange. It is a dot product, right? This row is a uh, one by 300 row vector. If we compute the uh, dot product between this row vector with the column vector of orange, it will give us this one number zi, okay? So this is the, the nature of the competition. So it is a bunch of inner product that we need to do. All right, so that's how the competition looks like. So for any, pair of context words mm, C and the target word T, the probability of the target word given a context word is the inner product raised to the power, uh, the exponential function of the inner products normalized by all the uh, inner products. And this is how the YT is computed, okay? So for example, the activation, uh, so the probability for word um, zoo is the inner product between um, the E prime of zoo times E of orange uh, normalized by the summation, okay? So this summation is uh, uh, consistent across all the, all the words, so that's, how the probability for each target word is computed.
And then given this probability, we can use the uh, loss function uh, for softmax to compute the loss. Remember, the loss is the the ground truth y i times the logarithm of y hats, and then uh, make the summation across all the words. So and then use this loss back to backprop to update the embedding matrix uh, embedding matrix e, and of course the embedding matrix e prime is also updated. E prime is the parameters associated with the softmax layer. But uh, in, in practice, we will find that people have done this comparison before. People compared uh, which embedding matrix it is E or E prime that is more useful. And typically it is the E matrix that is more useful. Okay, so that's for, that's the competition uh, graph for the skip gram method. Okay, so now let's, uh, uh, talk about the problems with the softmax. So in order to compute one probability, we need to compute uh, the dot product, right? And also the summation of all the, uh, of all the words in the, uh, in, the, in the vocabulary, right? We need to iterate from one to 10,000. And that's actually a huge amount of computation, especially when you are vocabulary size is big, okay? So in order to tackle this issue uh, uh, in the original paper, um, there are two methods uh, approach, two approaches uh, proposed. The first one is called hierarchical softmax. So it changes the, uh, the task, the, the, learning, the, the learning goal it's, it is not a strictly defined softmax, but it comes a hierarchical softmax, which uh, decompose the softmax into several steps of binary classification. Uh, for example, the first binary classification, binary classification classifies whether the target word belongs to the first half of the vocabulary, of the vocabulary or the second half. Then in the next layer, it will define whether it is below the between it belongs to the first 2500 words or the uh, words in the middle and so on until we reach the uh, target word so with this decomposition we basically turn the problem into a, a binary tree right and the binary tree the height the depth of the binary tree is the logarithm of the total numbers of the nodes in the in the tree so it's significantly saves time for us and the product of the, the target product, the target probability is the product of the probabilities along the path. So the competition, amount of competition is reduced by this uh, factor. And another more typically, a more uh, commonly used uh, technique is uh, the so-called uh, negative sampling, oops. Negative sampling. Uh, it is more uh, commonly used than a hierarchical softmax because uh, the the loss functions is easy is designed is defined in an easier way. Um, so look at let's look at the example. We will simplify the learning problem not into a uh, strictly defined softmax but with some uh, alternations. And the problem is that. Given the context word, we want to predict if a random word is its target or not within a certain window. Okay, so here there are two factors involved. We want to first pick a random word within the V, within the vector, within the vocabulary. And we want to predict whether it is the task or not. So it becomes a binary cl classification problem. It is not a soft max. It is a logistic regression, basically. And doing a logistic regression, of course, is much easier than the full soft max layer, uh, than the full soft max classification. And the task becomes that, okay, for example, if we randomly select the word juice as a target, then of course it is our target. It is within the window. And for king, for example, if we randomly sample a word king, 
it is not within this sentence. So the targets, it is not our, so the selected, the randomly selected word is not our target. So the ground truth label becomes one. For other, for other words, for example, the, of, they all become the targets labels. The ground truth labels are all zero, okay? So we'll use these uh, randomly sampled pairs, context word and target word pairs to form the modified loss function, okay? So I think I will leave the content to uh, next lecture, to next week. And uh, next week we will wrap up the word embedding technique and uh, we'll probably enter the uh, dimension reduction uh, uh, chapter because dimension reduction chapter, for example, PCA, it is also co uh, closely related to, uh, it can be applied to the word embedding uh, vectors. All right, uh, that's uh, so much for today. And thank you for 